from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Cyprian Cat by Dorothy Sayers It's extraordinarily decent of you to come along and see me like this, Herringay. Believe me, I do appreciate it. It isn't every busy attorney who do as much for such a hopeless sort of client. I only wish I could spin you a more workable kind of story. But honestly, I can only tell you exactly what I told Peabody. Of course, I can see he doesn't believe a word of it, and I don't blame him. He thinks I ought to be able to make up a more plausible tale than that. I suppose I could, but what's the use? One's almost bound to fall down somewhere one tries to swear to a lie. What I'm going to tell you is the absolute truth. I fired one shot and one shot only. And that was at the cat. It's funny that one should be hanged for shooting at a cat. Mary Dew and I were always the best of friends. School and college and all that sort of thing. We didn't see very much of each other after the war because we were living at opposite ends of the country, but we met in town from time to time and rode occasionally, and each of us knew that the other was there in the background, so to speak. Two years ago he wrote and told me he was getting married. He had just turned forty and the girl was fifteen years younger, and he was tremendously in love. It gave me a bit of a jolt, you know, how it is when your friends marry. You feel they will never be quite the same again, and I'd got used to the idea that Mary Dew and I were cut out to be old bachelors. But of course, I congratulated him and sent him a wedding present, and I did sincerely hope he'd be happy. He was obviously head over heels, almost dangerously so, I thought, considering all things. Though except for the difference in age, it seemed suitable enough. He told me he had met her at, of all places, a rectory garden party down in Norfolk, and that she had actually never been out of her native village. I mean, literally, not so much as a trip to the nearest town. I'm not trying to convey that she wasn't first class, or anything like that. Her father was some queer sort of recluse, a medievalist or something, desperately poor. He died shortly after their marriage. I didn't see anything of them for the first year or so. Meridu is a civil engineer, you know, and he took his wife away after the honeymoon to Liverpool, where he was doing something in connection with the harbor. It must have been a big change for her from the wilds of Norfolk. I was in Birmingham with my nose kept pretty close to the grindstone, so we only exchanged occasional letters. His were what I can only call deliriously happy, especially at first. Later on, he seemed a little worried about his wife's health. She was restless, town life didn't suit her. He'd be glad when he could finish up his Liverpool job and get her way into the country. There wasn't any doubt about their happiness, you understand. She'd got him body and soul, as they say, and as far as I could make out, it was mutual. I want to make that perfectly clear. Well, to cut a long story short, Meridu wrote to me at the beginning of last month and said that he was just off to a new job, a waterworks extension scheme down in Somerset, and he asked if I could possibly cut loose and join them there for a few weeks. He wanted to spend time with me, and Felice was longing to make my acquaintance. They had got rooms at the village inn. It was rather a remote spot, but there was fishing and scenery and so forth, and I should be able to keep Felice company while he was working up at the dam. I was about fed up with Birmingham, what with the heat and one thing and another, and it looked pretty good to me, and I was due for a holiday anyhow, so I fixed up to go. I had a bit of business to do in town, which I calculated would take me about a week, so I said I'd go down to Little Hexham on June 20th. As it happened, my business in London finished itself off unexpectedly soon. 
and on the 16th I found myself absolutely free and stuck in a hotel with road drills working just under the windows and a tar spraying machine to make things livelier. You remember what a hot month it was. Flaming June and no mistake about it. I didn't see any point in waiting, so I sent off a wire to Meridu, packed my bag, and took the train for Somerset the same evening. I couldn't get a compartment to myself, but I found a first-class smoker with only three seats occupied and stowed myself, thankfully, into the fourth corner. There was a military-looking old boy, an elderly female with a lot of bags and baskets, and a girl. I thought I should have a nice, peaceful journey. So, I should have, if it hadn't been for the unfortunate way I'm built. It was quite all right at first. As a matter of fact, I think I was half asleep, and I only woke up properly at 7 o'clock when the waiter came to say that dinner was on. The other people weren't taking it. And when I came back from the restaurant car, I found that the old boy had gone, and there were only the two women left. I settled down in my corner again, and gradually, as we went along, I found a horrible feeling creeping over me that there was a cat in the compartment somewhere. I'm one of those wretched people who can't stand cats. I don't mean just that I prefer dogs. I mean that the presence of a cat in the same room with me makes me feel like nothing on earth. I can't describe it, but I believe quite a lot of people are affected that way. Something to do with electricity or so, they tell me. I've read that very often the dislike is mutual, but it isn't so with me. The brutes seem to find me abominably fascinating, make a beeline for my legs every time. It's a funny sort of complaint, and it doesn't make me at all popular with dear old ladies. Anyway... I began to feel more and more awful, and I realized that the old girl at the other end of the seat must have a cat in one of her innumerable baskets. I thought of asking her to put it out in the corridor, or calling the garden and having it removed, but I knew how silly it would sound and made up my mind to try and stick it. I couldn't say the animal was misbehaving itself or anything, and she looked a pleasant old lady. It wasn't her fault that I was a freak. I tried to distract my mind by looking at the girl. She was worth looking at, too. Very slim and dark-haired, with one of those dead white skins that make you think of magnolia blossoms. She had the most astonishing eyes, too. I've never seen eyes quite like them. A very pale brown, almost amber, set wide apart and a little slanting, and they seemed to have a kind of luminosity of their own, if you get what I mean. I don't know if this sounds... I don't want you to think I was bowled over or anything. As a matter of fact, she held no sort of attraction for me, though I could imagine a different type of man going crazy over her. She was just unusual, that was all. But however much I tried to think of other things, I couldn't get rid of the uncomfortable feeling, and eventually I gave it up and went out into the corridor. I just mention this because it will help you to understand the rest of the story. If you can only realize how perfectly awful I feel when there's a cat about, even when it's shut up in a basket, you'll understand better how I came to buy the revolver. Well, we got to Hexham Junction, which was the nearest station to Little Hexham, and there was old Mary Dew waiting on the platform. The girl was getting out too, but not the old lady with the cat, thank goodness. And I was just handing her luggage out after her when he came galloping up and hailed us. Hello, he said. Why, that's splendid. Have you introduced yourselves? So I tumbled to it, then, that the girl was Mrs. Meridu, who'd been up to town on a shopping expedition. And I explained to her about my change of plans, and she said how jolly it was that I could come, the usual things. I noticed what an attractive low voice she had and how graceful her movements were, and I understood, though mind you, I didn't share Meridu's infatuation. We got into his car. Mrs. Meridu sat in the back, and I got up beside Meridu and was very glad to feel the air and to get rid of the oppressive electric feeling I'd had in the train. He told me the place suited them wonderfully and had given Felice an absolutely new lease on life, so to speak. He said he was very fit, too, but I thought myself that he looked rather fagged and nervy. You'd have liked that in, Herringay. 
the real old fashioned stuff as quaint as you make them and everything genuine none of your Tottenham Court Road antiques we all had our grub and Mrs. Meridew said she was tired so she went up to bed early and Meridew and I had a drink and went for a stroll around the village it's a tiny hamlet quite at the other end of nowhere lights out at ten little thatched houses with pinched up attic windows like furry ears the place purred in its sleep Mary Dew's working gang didn't sleep there of course they'd run up huts for them at the dams a mile beyond the village the landlord was just locking up the bar when we came in a block of a man with an absolutely expressionless face his wife was a thin sandy-haired woman who looked as though she was too downtrodden to open her mouth but I found out afterwards that was a mistake for one evening, when he'd taken one or two too many and showed signs of wanting to make a night of it, his wife sent them off upstairs with a gesture and a look that took the heart out of him. That first night she was sitting on the porch and hardly glanced at us as we passed her. I always thought her an uncomfortable kind of woman, but she certainly kept her house most exquisitely neat and clean. They'd given me a noble bedroom close under the eaves of the long low casement window overlooking the garden. The sheets smelled of lavender and I was between them and asleep almost before you could count to ten. I was tired, you see. But later in the night I woke up. I was too hot, so took off some of the blankets and then strolled across to the window to get a breath of air. The garden was bathed in moonshine and on the lawn I could see something twisting and turning oddly. I stared a bit before I made it out to be two cats. They didn't worry me at that distance and I watched them for a bit before I turned in again. They were rolling over one another and jumping away again and chasing their own shadows and on the grass, intent on their own mysterious business, taking themselves seriously the way cats always do. It looked like a kind of ritual dance. Then something seemed to startle them and they scampered away. I went back to bed, but I couldn't get to sleep again. My nerves seemed to be all on edge. I lay watching the window and listening to a kind of soft rustling noise that seemed to be going on in the big wisteria that ran along my side of the house. And then something landed with a soft thud on the sill. A great Cyprian cat. What did you say? Well, one of those striped gray and black cats. Tabby, that's right. In my part of the country, they call them Cypress cats or Cyprian cats. I'd never seen such a monster. It stood with its head cocked sideways, staring into the room and rubbing its ears very softly against the upright bar of the casement. Of course, I couldn't do with that. I shooed the brute away, and it made off without a sound. Heat or no heat, I shut and fastened the window. Far out in the shrubbery, I thought I heard a faint meowing, then silence. After that, I went straight off to sleep again and lay like a log till the girl came in to call me. The next day, Meridu ran us up in his car to see the place where they were making the dam, and that was the first time I realized that Felice's nervousness had not been altogether cured. He showed us where they had diverted part of the river into a swift little stream that was to be used for working the dynamo of an electrical plant. There were a couple of planks laid across the stream, and he wanted to take us over to show us the engine. It wasn't extraordinarily wide or dangerous, but Mrs. Mary Duke peremptorily refused to cross it and got quite hysterical when he tried to insist. Eventually, he and I went over and inspected the machinery by ourselves. When we got back, she had recovered her temper and apologized for being so silly. Mary Duke abased himself, of course, and I began to feel a little de trop. She told me afterwards that she had once fallen into a river as a child and nearly drowned, and I left her with a, what you call it, a complex about running water. And for, for this one trifling episode, I never heard a single sharp word pass between them all the time I was there, nor for a whole week that I noticed anything else to suggest a flaw in Mrs. Meridew's radiant health. Indeed, as the days wore on to midsummer and the heat grew more intense, her whole body seemed to glow with vitality. It was as though she were lit up from within. Meridu was out all day and working very hard. I thought he was overdoing it and asked him if he was sleeping badly. 
He told me that on the contrary, he fell asleep every night the moment his head touched the pillow and, what was most unusual with him, had not dreams of any kind. I felt well enough, but the hot weather made me languid and disinclined for exertion. Mrs. Marydew took me out for long drives in the car. I would sit for hours, lulled into a half-slumber by the rush of warm air and the purring of the engine and gazing at my driver, upright at the wheel, her eyes fixed unwaveringly upon the spinning road. We explored the whole of the country to the south and east of Little Hexham, and once or twice went as far north as Bath. Once I suggested that we should turn eastward over the bridge and run down into what looked like rather beautiful wooded country. But Mrs. Marydew didn't care for the idea. She said it was a bad road and that the scenery on that side was disappointing. Altogether, I spent a pleasant week at Little Hexham, and if it had not been for the cats, I should have been perfectly comfortable. Every night, the garden seemed to be haunted by them. The Cyprian cat that I had seen the first night of my stay, and a little ginger one, and a horrible stinking black tom were especially tiresome, and one night there was a terrified white kitten that meowed for an hour on end under my window. I flung boots and books at my visitors till I was hardly weary, but they seemed determined to make the inn garden their rendezvous. The nuisance grew worse from night to night. On one occasion I counted fifteen of them, sitting on their hind ends in a circle, while the Cyprian cat danced her shadow dance among them, working in and out like a weaver's shuttle. I had to keep my window shut. The Cyprian cat evidently made a habit of climbing up by the wisteria. The door, too, for once, when I had gone down to fetch something from the sitting room, I found her on my bed, kneading the coverlet with her paws. With her eyes closed in a sensuous ecstasy, I beat her off, and she spat at me as she fled into the dark passage. I asked the landlady about her, but she replied rather curtly that they kept no cat at the end, and it is true that I never saw any of the beast in the daytime. But one evening, about dusk, I caught the landlord in one of the outbuildings. He had the ginger cat on his shoulder and was feeding her with something that looked like strips of liver. I remonstrated with him for encouraging the cats about the place and asked whether I could have a different room, explaining that the nightly caterwauling disturbed me. He half opened his slits of eyes and murmured that he would ask his wife about it, but nothing was done, and in fact I believe there was no other bedroom in the house. And all this time, the weather got hotter and heavier, working up for thunder with the sky like brass and the earth like iron, and the air quivering over it so that it hurt your eyes to look at it. All right, Herringay, I'm trying to keep to the point. And I'm not concealing anything from you. I say that my relations with Mrs. Marydew were perfectly ordinary. Of course, I saw a good deal of her because, as I explained, Mary Dew was out all day. We went up to the dam with him in the morning and brought the car back, and naturally we had to amuse one another as best we could till the evening. She seemed quite pleased to be in my company, and I couldn't dislike her. I can't tell you what we talked about, nothing in particular. She was not a talkative woman. She would sit or lie for hours in the sunshine, hardly speaking, only stretching out her body to the light and heat. Sometimes she would spend a whole afternoon playing with a twig or pebble while I sat by and smoked. Restful? No, I shouldn't call her a restful personality exactly. Not to me, at any rate. In the evening, she would liven up and talk a little more, but she generally went up to bed early and left Mary Dew and me to chat together in the garden. Oh, about the revolver? Yes, I bought that in Bath when I had been at Little Hexham exactly a week. We drove over in the morning, and while Mrs. Meridew got some things for her husband, I prowled round the second-hand shops. I would intended to get an air gun or a pea shooter or something of that kind when I saw this. You've seen it, of course. It's very tiny, what people in books describe as a little more than a toy, but quite deadly enough. The old boy who sold it to me didn't seem to know much about firearms. He'd taken it in pawn some time back, he told me, and there were ten rounds of ammunition with it. He made no bones about a license or anything, glad enough to make a sale, no doubt, without putting difficulty in a customer's way. 
I told him I knew how to handle it, and mentioned by way of a joke that I meant to take a pot shot or two at the cats. That seemed to wake him up a bit. He was a dried up little fellow with a scrawny gray beard and a stringy neck. He asked me where I was staying. I told him at Little Hexham. Better be careful, sir, he said. They think a heap of their cats down there, and it's reckon unlucky to kill them. And then he had something I couldn't quite catch about a silver bullet. He was a doddering old fellow, and he seemed to have some sort of scruple about letting me take the parcel away, but I assured him that I was perfectly capable of looking after it and myself. I left him standing in the door of his shop, pulling out his beard and staring after me. That night the thunder came. The sky had turned to lead before evening, but the dull heat was more oppressive than the sunshine. Both the Meridus seemed to be in a state of nerves, he sulky and swearing at the weather and the flies, and she rot up to a queer kind of vivid excitement. Thunder affects some people that way. I wasn't much better, and to make things worse, I got the feeling that the house was full of cats. I couldn't see them, but I knew they were there, lurking behind the cupboards and flitting noiselessly about the corridors. I could scarcely sit in the parlor, and I was thankful to escape to my room. Cats or no cats, I had to open the window, and I sat there with my pajama jacket, unbuttoned, trying to get a breath of air. But the place was like the inside of a copper furnace, and pitch dark. I could scarcely see from my window where the bushes ended and the lawn began, but I could hear and feel the cats. There were little scrapings in the wisteria and scufflings among the leaves, and about eleven o'clock one of them started the concert with a loud and hideous wail. Then another and another joined in. I'll swear there were fifty of them. Presently I got that foul sensation of nausea, and the flesh crawled on my bones, and I knew that one of them was slinking close to me in the darkness. I looked around quickly, and there was she was, the great Cyprian, right against my shoulder, her eyes glowing like green lamps. I yelled and struck out at her, and she snarled as she leaped out and down. I heard her thump the gravel, and the yowling burst out all over the garden with renewed vehemence. Then all in a moment there was utter silence, and in the far distance there came a flickering blue flash and then another, and the first of them I saw the far garden wall, topped all along its length with cats, like a nursery freeze. When the second flash came, the wall was empty. At two o'clock the rain came. For three hours before that I had sat there, watching the lightning as it spat across the sky and exulting in the crash of the thunder. The storm seemed to carry off all the electrical disturbance in my body. I could have shouted with excitement and relief. The first heavy drops fell, then a steady downpour, then a deluge. It struck the iron-baked garden with a noise like steel rods falling. The smell of the ground came up intoxicatingly, and the wind rose and flung the rain in against my face. At the other end of the passage, I heard a window thrown to and fastened, but I leaned out into the tumult and let the water drench my head and shoulders. The thunder still rumbled intermittently, but with less noise and farther off, and in an occasional flash I saw the white grill of falling water drawn between me and the garden. It was after one of these thunder peals that I became aware of a knocking at my door. I opened it, and there was Mary Dew. He had a candle in his hand, and his face was terrified. Felice, she said abruptly, she's ill. I can't wake her. For God's sake, come and give me a hand. I hurried down the passage after him. There were two beds in his room, a great four-poster hung with crimson damask, and a small camp bedstead drawn up near to the window. The small bed was empty, the bedclothes tossed aside. Evidently, he had just risen from it. And the four-poster lay Mrs. Meridew, naked with only a sheet upon her. She was stretched flat upon her back, her long black hair in two plates over her shoulders. Her face was waxen and shrunk, like the face of a corpse, and her pulse, when I felt it, was so faint that at first I could scarcely feel it. Her breathing was very slow and shallow, and her flesh cold. I shook her, but there was no response at all. 
I lifted her eyelids and noticed how the eyeballs were turned up under the upper lid so that only the whites were visible. The touch of my fingertip upon the sensitive ball evoked no reaction. I immediately wondered whether she took drugs. Meridu seemed to think it necessary to make some explanation. He was babbling about the heat. She couldn't bear so much as a silk nightgown. She had suggested that he should occupy the other bed. He had slept heavily, right through the thunder. The rain blowing in on his face had aroused him. He had got up and shut the window. Then he had called to Felice to know if she was all right. He thought the storm might have frightened her. There was no answer. He had struck a light. Her condition had alarmed him, and so on. I told him to pull himself together and to try, by chafing his wife's hand and feet, to restore the circulation. I had it firmly in my mind that she was under the influence of some opiate. We set to work, rubbing and pinching and slapping her with wet towels and shouting her name in her ear. It was like handling a dead woman, except for the very slight but perfectly regular rise and fall of her bosom, on which, with a kind of surprise, that there should be any flaw in its magnolia whiteness, I noticed a large brown mole just over the heart. To my perturbed fancy it suggested a wound and a menace. We had been hard at it for some time, with the sweat pouring off of us when we became aware of something going on outside the window, a stealthy bumping and scraping against the panes. I snatched up the candle and looked out. On the sill, the Cyprian cat sat and clawed at the casement. Her drenched fur clung limply to her body. Her eyes glared into mine. Her mouth was open in protest. She scrabbled furiously at the latch, her hind claws slipping and scratching on the woodwork. I hammered on the pane and bawled at her, and she struck back at the glass as though possessed. As I cursed her and turned away, she set up a long, despairing wail. Mary Dew called to me to bring back the candle and leave the brute alone. I returned to the bed, but the dismal crying went on and on incessantly. I suggested to Meridew that he should wake the landlord and get hot water bottles and some brandy from the bar, and see if a messenger could not be sent for a doctor. He departed on this errand while I went on with my massage. It seemed to me that the pulse was growing still fainter. Then I suddenly recollected that I had a small brandy flask in my bag. I ran out to fetch it, and as I did so, the cat suddenly stopped its howling. As I entered my own room, the air blowing through the open window struck gratefully upon me. I found my bag in the dark and was rummaging for the flask among my shirts and socks when I heard a loud triumphant meow and turned round in time to see the Cyprian cat crouched for a moment on the sill before it sprang in past me and out at the door. I found the flask and hastened back with it, just as Mary Dew and the landlord came running up the stairs. We all went into the room together. As we did so, Mrs. Mary Dew stirred sat up and asked us what in the world was the matter. I have seldom felt quite such a fool. Next day, the weather was cooler. The storm had cleared the air. What Meridu had said to his wife, I do not know. None of us made any public allusion to the night's disturbance, and to all appearance, Mrs. Meridu was in the best of health and spirits. Meridu took a day off from the waterworks and we all went for a long drive and picnic together. We were on the best of terms with one another. Ask Meridu. He will tell you the same thing. He would not. He could not surely say otherwise. Same thing. I can't believe Herringay. I simply cannot believe that he could imagine or suspect me. I say there was nothing to suspect. Nothing. Yes. This is the important date. The 24th of June. I can't tell you any more details. There is nothing to tell. We came back and had dinner just as usual. All three of us were together all day till bedtime. On my honor, I had no private meeting of any kind that day, either with him or with her. I was the first to go to bed, and I heard the others come upstairs about half an hour later. They were talking cheerfully. It was a moonlit night. For once, no caterwauling came to trouble me. I didn't even bother to shut the window or the door. I put the revolver on the chair beside me before I lay down. Yes, it was loaded. I had no special object in putting it there except that I meant to have a go at the cats if they started their games again. 
I was desperately tired and thought I should drop off to sleep at once, but I didn't. I must have been overtired, I suppose. I lay and looked at the moonlight, and then about midnight I heard what I had been half expecting, a stealthy scrabbling in the wisteria and a faint meowing sound. I sat up in bed and reached for the revolver. I heard the plop as the big cat sprang up onto the window ledge. I saw her black and silver flanks and the outline of her round head, pricked ears and upright tail. I aimed and fired, and the beast let out one frightful cry and sprang down into the room. I jumped out of bed. The crack of the shot had sounded terrific in the silent house, and somewhere I heard a distant voice call out. I pursued the cat into the passage, revolver in hand, with some idea of finishing it off, I suppose, and then at the door of the Meridew's room I saw Mrs. Meridew. She stood with one hand on each doorpost, swaying to and fro. Then she fell down at my feet. Her bare breast was all stained with blood. And as I stood staring at her, clutching the revolver, Mary Duke came out and found us, like that. Well, Herringate, that's my story, exactly as I told it to Peabody. I'm afraid it won't sound very well in court, but what can I say? The trail of blood led from my room to hers. The cat must have run that way. I know it was the cat I shot. I can't offer any explanation. I don't know who shot Mrs. Meridew or why. I can't help it if the people at the inn say they never saw the Cyprian cat. Meridew saw it that other night, and I know he wouldn't lie about it. Search the house, Herringay. That's the only thing to do. Pull the place to pieces till you find the body of the Cyprian cat. It will have my bullet in it.